Ah, banjo. That word means a lot of things to me. It's my favourite stringed instrument, my fourth favourite Diddy Kong Racing character, my third favourite Brevis Bear, and most importantly, it's my favourite series that started on the Nintendo 64. I would want to call it the Banjo-Kazooie franchise, since the bear gets all the attention, but Banjo Pilot ruined that idea. Thanks. Plus even Kazooie herself calls it the Banjo series during Nuts and Bolts. She is so defeated. Depending on who you talk to, the Banjo franchise means a lot of different things. Some people only talk about the first game, and if you're lucky, the second game too. Some include its Xbox 360 title as well, since for all intents and purposes it is the third mainline game. And then you have people like me, that include everything. Obviously this includes Grunty's Revenge, the mostly forgotten GBA entry that, unlike Banjo Pilot, is a masterpiece. Though I do still like Pilot, let's not get carried away here. Rare's handheld teams were the unsung heroes of that company. I love all their games, whether they be controversial or unknown. The Donkey Kong Land games are great, but they did more than just work on that franchise. We saw Mr. Pants put into a video game, and they brought back Saberman for his reboot before he was stampeded back into obscurity again. Every game the handheld team made was good, or at the very least, interesting. But if I had to pick a favourite, it would be Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge, no doubt. This third entry in the Banjo series is more of a 1.5 midquel set between Kazooie and Tui, although technically the majority of the game is a prequel to everything, it's a time travel game. Initially set two months after the first game's ending, Grunty is still trapped under that stone that will eventually be removed two years later thanks to his sisters. Since destroying or even just moving the rock is so hard, Grunty's assistant Klungo decided to do something much easier and made a mechanised body for Gruntilda to put her spirit into. This way she can be free of her shallow grave, even if her physical body will still rot there. Before I go any further, I just need to say I love this design of Grunty. One aspect I really enjoy of her character is that every game which features her, well except Pilot and now Smash Ultimate, shows a different design. Originally she was covered in green skin, in Tui she was just a skeleton, and in Nuts and Bolts, she is a skull that the Lord of Games mercifully gave her body to. It's a nice progression, but since they can't do anything with her physical body, we get an odd sidestep here that doesn't really fit into the same linear system. But this is iconic, and honestly it's the most threatening she's ever looked. This is quite possibly my favourite design, even if it is the outlier. And since this is still before Tui's introduction, we are still graced with a rhyming Gruntilda, which helps alleviate the threatening look and put more charm into her character. This is a punished Grunty who rhymes. It's the best of both worlds. As this was developed after Tui, we get so many references and in-universe introductions to characters who were actually introduced to us for player already. If you like lore, this is the perfect game for you. This expands on Tui without becoming the divisive bloat that it is. Some people don't like slow builds, they like to have fun consistently for some reason, but it's a message Grunty's Revenge mostly sticks to. I'm happy with anything, Grunty Industries is one of my favourite levels in the entire series, so you know my opinions are worth listening to. For the most part, backtracking isn't really a thing here, this follows Kazooie's lead in that aspect. But unlike Kazooie, at least the Nintendo 64 version, notes remain collected, so you could argue that Grunty's Revenge is the best game in the series in terms of sheer collecting without any of the annoyance. Well, except for arguably Kazooie's Xbox re-release, that is. Grunty's Revenge is such an odd amalgamation of the two games prior, and it's a healthy middle ground without feeling too restricted by adhering closer to either game. This new mechanised Grunty bird naps Kazooie and travels back in time to prevent the duo from ever meeting. That way the timeline can change, and Grunty can achieve her goals without the duo's interference. It's a great idea for a plan, the game doesn't really elaborate much more than that. A lot of it is left up to interpretation since Grunty seemingly doesn't do much while back in time, but hey, solid plan, A for effort. Banjo is now on his own, and since he hasn't learned to split up moves yet, he is really helpless. However, things aren't for naught as Mumbo shows up and is basically like, hey, 
I can send you back in time too. So Banjo goes back in time and follows Grunty. It's as easy as that. The only downside to this time travel is that Banjo and Kazooie did lose some of their memories, which from a gameplay perspective means they need to relearn their moves. This is a great solution to the sticky timeline wicket here. The duo ended Kazooie with a lot of moves, and they still hold on to them in Tui. This way the game gets to reteach the moves from the first game without feeling redundant, and all the new moves they learn here can still be forgotten by the time they return, since time travel does mess with memories. That way they are all prepped for Banjo Tui, plot holes covered. And maybe that even explains how they forgot the claw swipe. That was just one of the things caught in the mix here. Banjo is now 20 years in the past, which for him in 1998 means it's 1978. And that's sobering because 20 years prior to the video's publication, it would be 2002. I do not like time. Thanks to a mole from this era called Bozai, who was filling bottles in Jam Jar's role, Banjo, and eventually Kazooie aren't helpless. New moves are constantly taught. The first of these new moves is Banjo using his backpack as a weapon, which is something he would later learn in Tui, but this variation is much quicker, generally more useful, and it can activate pressure plates that the console games reserved for a ground pound. The only downside is we don't have the glitch that lets us double jump, but excluding that, this is basically a straight up improvement over Tui's pack whack. This is also superior to any of the other attacks the duo use when standing still. Pretty much everything else is a direct port of moves from the N64 games, or recontextualized enough that it is fundamentally different, but in-universe it's basically the same thing. Since this is a clean slate with two games of hindsight to build off, we have a complete moveset here that is very robust, and covers basically every necessity without too much filler. We don't have things like a ground pound and a fancier drill-like ground pound, we can still shoot eggs, talent trot, use golden feathers, and basically most of the moves you associate with the N64 titles. It's important to put this basic gameplay all out in the open now. The moves are a huge part of the Banjo-Kazooie platformer experience. Even if you have great world building and level design, a lot of players are scared off if it doesn't feel like Banjo, and this does feel like Banjo. Not to rag on nuts and bolts, it's a good game regardless of what people online told you 10 years ago, or your own gut reactions to any kind of change. But it is still hard to sell traditional Banjo fans on that game, and I'm still trying to convince some of them that Tui was actually a good game. Baby steps here. While it's had an entirely different perspective, it looks entirely different and uses far fewer buttons, I would argue Grunty's Revenge has more in common with the first game than Tui has in common with the first game. This is a more traditional collect-a-thon without any of the big brain interconnectedness or jiggies that require eight other things to be done first just to unlock it. But this isn't just more Banjo-Kazooie. There are some nice differences here that set it apart and make it feel like more than just the same on less powerful hardware. The game opens up to Spiral Mountain, but unlike the other entries, this is all we get to explore outside of stages. However, this is more than enough as this is an earlier depiction of the mountains that feel much bigger and have a lot more crammed into it, including Jiggy Wiggy's temple to open stages and Honey Bee's hive to increase health. This isn't just a small circle with a spiral in it, this is a really big rectangle with a lot of things in it. The hub is split into a lot of smaller self-contained areas accessed after learning new moves, so it still feels like the previous hub worlds even if we're not physically going through as much space. We only have five worlds here, but much like the moves, this is all hits and no filler. Banjo gets to know the inhabitants of the 1978 Spiral Mountain, including the Jinjo Oracle, who is basically a talking statue of a Jinjo, reminiscent of a Jinjinator. It adds to the deep lore of the Jinjos. In fact, as this is said in the past, we can see Grunty's lair as it's still under construction, and we have the remnants of a rock sculpture of King Jingling's head, which has collapsed at the base of a mountain. Grunty took this land from its presumably indigenous owners, the Jinjos, just in case you thought she couldn't get any worse. Despite the extra world building here, Jinjos serve the same basic role, collect them in a level and get a jiggy when all five in a stage are saved. And this brings me to the best part of these games. The stuff we do most of the time, collect shiny things. 
The levels are littered with things to keep your brain engaged. Notes are spread out to lead you from place to place. Sometimes they come in small nests that contain multiple at once, which is fine since these are ultimately smaller levels and notes everywhere would be tiresome. Jiggies are up next, the main collectible, and I love their rotating sprites here that really sell the 3D illusion. Thankfully, the duo don't do a long dance after collecting them, so the pace is never halted here. These are usually rewarded for completing some kind of simple objective, and this is where the game shines for me. It's basically a collection of short, fun moments that never overstay their welcome. The first world to explore is Cliff Farm, and this does serve the role of safe and predictable grass world, but the farm aesthetic does bolster it. The series never did farm levels before, and since the other environments coming up are riding on the series' tropes, this is a golden feather in its cap. It also introduces us to the template that this game will be using repeatedly, since every level feels more like a blueprint than ever before. What I mean by that is Kazooie's levels were basically free form, with the same collectibles being handed out on whatever whim the designer wanted at the moment. Tui added a lot more complexity and scripted moments, but this did result in a bit more of a predictable process. Every stage had a boss, every stage had a transformation, Mumbo was playable on every stage to modify an aspect of a level, and mini games were plentiful. Cliff Farms does have objectives to truly call its own, like helping the delightfully named Mother Clucko rescue her chicks, and using the newly taught moves to explore areas where you couldn't previously, like using the ability to swim to go into a small pool of water which on its own doesn't sound very spectacular, but I am very impressed with how they managed to convert swimming into a perspective where they shouldn't have honestly attempted it. None of the levels have a lot of underwater areas to explore, even the upcoming beach level only has a small crevice that can be used, and these are all signposted wonderfully with a visual cue of bubbles, so you don't need to trial and error every single water source. So Cliff Farms does have some ideas truly of its own, but the template that it has laid out will become very apparent with later levels. That being said, it won't truly get old as every instance we have to do something is short enough that fatigue won't set in, but collectively it adds up, and while it's not tiresome, you still can predict some of the things you'll be doing in every level. The first of these that I experienced was a trip down a slide to rescue some chicken eggs that somehow weren't rolling down, they were just stationary. This is a kind of fun distraction. Banjo keeps sliding down and we have to avoid obstacles and collect eggs. We can only move left and right and this tickles my brain in the same way an auto runner does. I'm also pretty impressed with the visuals here, even though this is a very simple trick and not pushing the GBA at all. I love illusions of 3D depth, so this wins out for me, even if I know this isn't super compelling. The issue with the slide, however, is for repetition as this will come up many more times in the game. Something that did wear on me much sooner was the fishing game. We first see it here, and it certainly won't be the last time. This feels more like some kind of mediocre Mario Party minigame, and the repetition of it certainly doesn't help its case. But hey, I do like that this first one is contextualized as fishing sheep, since it is a farm after all, and it does serve as a nice tutorial for the concept which will get harder with hidden targets underwater. The best of the copy and pasted objectives first used here is the game's boss fight. While ones presented here aren't on the level of two of his better bosses, the game at least does something. Kazooie forgot about actual bosses until the end of the game, no matter what boss Boombox actually says. These fights are either going to be against Klungo or Grunty, and it's basically just the same two fights over and over, but they're nevertheless fun, and they do add some spice to the levels. Plus it gives us small extra snippets of story, which we really don't see much of in the game. Every time these bosses appear, we see more of the banter and how they plan to upgrade Grunty's mechanized body, and the more we see of Grunty the better, and Klungo too I suppose, even if he doesn't save to game. His encounters feel similar to how they will in Tui, but instead of the order being randomized, this is a linear progress with the first being by far the easiest, but it gets harder each time as you'll add another wrinkle to the process. This does do enough to make it feel fresh, but it's also not enough to hide the fact that it is basically the same fight four times. But hey, these are Klungo's best fights, they're still better than Tui's. 
Cliff Farms as a stage can't be discussed without mentioning the best part of it. Mumbo Jumbo with his swinging 70s bachelor pad. He gives Banjo the best transformation yet. It's a cute little mouse, and I love it and I wish more people knew about it. Following and Tui's lead, the transformations here all have little attacks or specific actions, so they can usually defend themselves, which was nice since Kazooie more often than not felt like you were defenseless against threats. Though the mouse here is the one exception to it all. It does still have the ability to activate context sensitive items, so this isn't just as basic as most of the first games there. But in terms of utility, this is basically just a pumpkin transformation that can activate things. The gimmick here is we can walk through small holes not accessible to a bear. It's fun, and it makes levels feel like more believable spaces, and I do think it is the cutest, but this isn't something you'd want to use outside of its specific use cases, since it is a weak and helpless rodent in a world full of angry gruntlings and whatever else is against you. Speaking of which, uh, the stage is full of gruntlings, which were common fodder in the first Kazooie game. I love them being here. I know the overusage of gruntlings in this game only serves to make each area feel less unique and ultimately show off the lack of polish afforded to this particular build, but I don't care. These enemies were only in the hub world of Kazooie, not in any individual levels, nor did they appear in the sequels. But this game knows what it has, and we get these guys everywhere, and I can't blame them, they are such an appealing design. It only makes more sense since Klungo and Grunty are messing with the stages more here, and it's only reasonable they'd throw their henchmen in here too. Though levels still have their own individual flourishes, in particular the grunt weeds of Cliff Farm. According to the Jinjo Oracle, this is the end result of combining two enemies, Gruntlings and Whiplashes, into a mutated combo. Thanks, Klungo. Oh yeah, and Whiplashes! They are here too! And this is the peak of the Whiplash fandom. These were only in a single level of Banjo-Kazooie, but now they're here in every single stage and the hub world. This, to us Whiplash fans, is how Buzz Bomber fans felt when they got a spirit in Smash Ultimate. And that's really all I can say about Cliff Farm. It is a serviceable level that sets up what will come later, and it is also the most unique stage since it's a farm. It's an archetype not properly visited in the series. Oh yeah, and also Kazooie is still entirely absent. This is a game about saving her after all. All Banjo could do in this level is jump, whack with his backpack, climb, roll, and swim. It's easy to forget that this level is basically a solo adventure, but it's beak drilled into your brain with level 2, Breagle Beach. This is the home of Kazooie's kin, and is actually where she is being held by Grunty, who is using the birds here as slave labor. While this doesn't sound like a super fun setting, it is actually one of the game's highlights. Sure, this level is just Treasure Trove Cove, but again. But I like Treasure Trove Cove, so that's not a bad thing. Plus, we don't have the terrifying sharks anymore, just the scary mines. And those clams that are just fodder and never really made me feel scared. The influences from Treasure Trove Cove don't just end with this being the second level in the game and the obligatory beach level, but we also have some other recurring motifs. Whether they were deliberate or not doesn't matter, these levels are so similar that Banjo Pilot uses the same environment and music for both stages. Mumbo is still here and offering his transformation services, which is different from Kazooie's beach stage since that didn't have Mumbo at all, but we don't have an original transformation here either. Instead, we can just become the mouse again, with the same situational benefits and drawbacks as before. You see, the transformations work entirely differently here. All five levels have Mumbo, there are four transformations across the game, with a new one appearing in every stage barring this one. The formula of previous games was you transform into a new form for each stage, and only that stage, and in the first game's case, not every stage even had a transformation available. Here, once you unlock the new transformation by collecting the one MacGuffin needed in each world, we can transform into any available form, so the mouse will be usable in all five stages. This is a really novel approach and it helps to make this game stand out even more so. Plus it means we don't need to have any redundancy with forms. There's no reason to have two different forms to go for a small gap, we can just use the mouse in every level. This means the transformations have to serve more specific utilities. This time the mouse is used to free some of Grunty's slaves, which is based. Grunty is pure evil in this game's cements it even more so than the other outings. All she did there was kidnap a kid, 
This big and mumbo attempt regicide and do us the favor of killing bottles, or as I like to call him, the lesser jam jars. I wouldn't be so quick to forgive her, but ultimately Banjo still did as they raced planes shortly thereafter, and Grunty even grew her skin back for the occasion, which was nice. This game doesn't outright say this, but I can only imagine that putting these birds to such strenuous slave labour is in the hopes of killing them which would prevent the birth of Kazooie, you know, the thing Grunty wants to do since she wants to stop them from meeting. Regardless of her attempts, Banjo frees them and then frees Kazooie herself after a pretty nice, but soon to be repeated boss fight against Mega Grunty. It's kind of liberating to finally have Kazooie again. The game has truly opened up more. The idea of keeping her from us was good, and I feel they did the most of it they could have without just limiting the game's potential. And thanks to Kazooie, we can now talent drop to reach previously inaccessible areas, and you don't even have to hold a button to keep it activated, so I would argue this is the best usage of it in the series. We also get the obvious extended jump range thanks to her wings, but the best thing Kazooie brings to her table is egg firing, and this is entirely different to how it was in Kazooie or Tui. Eggs can only be shot out of Kazooie's mouth, and she has to be used as a gun by Banjo. This was technically a move a duo learnt in Tui, but it was only used in first person segments so it was used sporadically and it felt entirely different. Here, since this is how standard and the camera remains the same, this just means we can move and shoot eggs at the same time and this is a great change. While I do love this and hope it becomes a standard going forward if we ever get another Banjo game, it wasn't implemented the best here due to the limited camera perspective and the fact we have to use a D-pad. The aiming isn't as precise as it should be. But hey, just the fact that we can move and shoot at the same time did mean I used eggs much more for combat than I ever did in the N64 games. While first person mode isn't here, a suitable replacement does debut in this level. And this could be described as either a boss fight or a mini game, depending on how charitable you are. We have a fight against a ghost pirate, but it's from a third person behind the character perspective, and we just have to strafe and fire back at the enemy. I love this, and it will be used again later for a really fun mecha grunty fight. I'm a sucker for this kind of 3D. And this is probably the best use of that pseudo 3D in the game. Earlier I said there were multiple Treasure Trove Cove references, well, there is one more. We have Captain Blubber here, the Banjo-Kazooie series MVP who debuted in Treasure Trove Cove by crying loudly. With the exception of Banjo Pilot because he was robbed, I swear, he has appeared in every single entry in the series and it's just great to see him in a much younger fashion. Here he is just a child going by the name of Little Blubber, and he gives us the chance to play a top-down minigame which will shortly become another staple of the levels. I can't be mad. These are fun and they remind me of a dodge challenges in Witchy World. Thanks Little Blubber for adding some fun here. In a less glorious place we have Mr. Ripovsky, and he just is sort of there I guess. He is this game's prototypical filler, and he just gives us jiggies for completing tasks or doing whatever minigame he ropes us into. He'll later get us involved in some more fun minigames, but as a character he just feels pretty lifeless. He's probably the weakest new addition to the character roster here and I am fully aware of the talking brown goop we'll meet later. Wow, this, uh, this breakdown kind of just ended on a bad note. And that's because most of everything else we do was already mentioned. We have a slide, we have an underwater section, and there's just some you'll just come across naturally. This doesn't minimize how fun the actual level is, it genuinely is a lot more fun than Cliff Farm. But the more that goes on, the less unique stuff there is to say. So before I dismiss how nice the third stage is, I just want to say that I love that every world here opens up with the same kind of entrance way that was all over Grunty's lair. Ooh, the world building, speculate about the significance. Bad Magic Bayou, this is the third level, and it kind of feels like two different Kazooie levels smushed together, and I mean that in the best possible way. In fact, this stage has the most world building thus far, so for the wiki writers out there, this level's a gold mine. In fact, this is the most varied level of a game so far, even if it doesn't initially appear that way. The bayou is, for all intents and purposes, a swamp like Bubble Gloop. I know swamps and bayous are technically different, but this is the same company that gave us angry Aztec. I don't think words mean anything to them. Taking full advantage of a talent trot, we have a lot of steep slopes that we can use to get to a higher vantage point, as this is a very tall level. 
but all the swampy goodness is down below because of uh, gravity. Initially appearing as a bootleg bubble gloop swamp, the actual differences become apparent pretty quickly. This is where the gruntlings train under the guidance of a gruntling drill sergeant. Everything you see is now recontextualized as their training rounds. The tires that are used as safe platforms over the goopy water aren't just there carelessly, these will be what the gruntlings would have to practice running through. Because of all this, not surprisingly, this is where we see the most enemy variety thus far. Not only do we have multiple colours of gruntlings, and their returning whiplash, and their similar counterpart, the stinglash, but there's also these goopy things called germuloids, there's piranhas in a bayou who hurt you, and the two most important boys, the green spooky ghosts, and my favourite, the chompers. They might have terrified me as a kid, but now I just adore them and their game plan of predictably attacking you whenever you come near. Oh yeah, and another enemy I never mentioned before, even though they were in the two previous levels because I don't really count them as an enemy, but the beehives, which function the way they did in the first Kazooie game, and they will attack you if they have bees buzzing around. While they on their own are uninteresting, they do segue into the topic of how health is replenished here. In Kazooie, you'd heal by collecting honeycomb, and your health always went up with them. In Tui, this is what would happen most of the time, but sometimes you'd get special honeycomb that technically had a risk or reward mentality behind them. It cycled through available health segments, and wherever you stopped it is where it would heal to. So in theory, you could lose health, but most of the time these were very easy, and they would pretty much always go up in a linear fashion so you could stop it at a comfortable place. Granted, they did become a little harder later in the game, but at worst, you'd probably still just get a nearly full restore. That being said, it was still a much more fun system than just a single honeycomb piece. There was also a random variant only in Witchy World, which meant that it would flash different health segments and you'd have to stop it and you couldn't just predictably count each and every segment till it got to the top. Well, Grunty's Revenge loved that idea and we have them everywhere. These are very common. Good luck timing it perfectly. The normal stopping one that went up linearly is still here for those that like to play it a bit safer, but this game didn't just stop at bringing back the old. In addition to regular honeycomb and these two counterparts, we also have the double honeycomb and it uh, heals two segments of health. That's a nice quality of life feature, I'm kind of surprised it wasn't in the originals. And if you run out of honeycomb, you get a game over, which means nothing, you just continue on. Much like Banjo-Tooie, death is actually beneficial sometimes since it can save you a minute or two. The bayou isn't just Grunty's training facility, it's also possibly her home, or will be her home, I don't know. There's a haunted manor here that strikes a resemblance with her home in Mad Monster Mansion, and though it's not obviously one to one, I can at least say if it isn't the same home, it serves the basis of her monster mansion that she lived in 20 years later. The interior of the house is such a nice change of pace, and really does help to make the stage feel like two separate stages that just so happen to be connected. At first we'll just get to explore the spooky home, and learn to shoot battery eggs, which are basically just another variation of eggs, like all of Tui's, but this time it shoots electricity. It's not very exciting, but it's serviceable, and I appreciate them putting some thought here, rather than just using the same egg variants all over again. Though much later the fire and ice eggs are taught again, they still feel different to their Tui counterparts given the different implementation. Interestingly, most of the time the different eggs need to be used. It's always signposted in the most obvious way, like the egg tolls in Rusty Bucket Bay. We don't solve puzzles, so you could argue this is just pointless busy work, but I'm not that cynical, and I love my birds shooting out eggs that contain electricity. Just don't think about it too much. I also like it when my bird drills her beak into the ground of extreme force, and Grunty's Revenge has me covered. We learned the build drill from Tui that was originally just an enhanced beak buster with a longer startup time. The regular beak buster isn't in this game as its role was replaced with the backpack whack. There is so much to love about the game during this time as our moveset has truly opened up, but what hasn't opened up is this one barricaded doorway in the manor. That's because we need to find a different way into it, which requires that we also bring in the new transformation for the stage. Mumbo's magic brightens my mood as we become a cute little candle, which I know doesn't sound cool, but it is. It's cute, it has fire attacks. This is everything seven-year-old me would have wanted. 
With the aforementioned fire, Banjo can now explore the spooky, dark areas of the manor. That's really it. This transformation does not have much utility, but I just love the way it looks. At least I can say it doesn't overstay its welcome, but it burns bright when it matters. And that's how I generally feel about this stage as a whole. It's great at the time, but it is one I forget about. But that's probably because it's sandwiched between my two favourite stages, and it's also the one stage in the game where we can't collect everything immediately, since we have to backtrack with a later transformation. This just leaves a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. So move over Bad Magic Bayou, Spiller's Harbour is here. I love Spiller's Harbour, like a lot. This will lose whatever credibility I still have, but Rusty Bucket Bay was one of my favourite stages in the original game, and outside of the hassle of recollecting notes in the Nintendo 64 version, I still have no problems with it. As a kid, I used to play on the stage and just pretend I was part of a ship staff. I know it's actually a disgusting environment, but at the time, I saw this as a much more relatable world with our modern conveniences. It looked like something you could actually see rather than a fairy tale or fantasy world. As a result, I actually loved how much more down-to-earth Tui was with its aesthetic, and it probably contributes to my blind love of that game. And Tui had its own rusty bucket as well, a stage that I used to just walk around and appreciate the fact that I was in a comparatively more relatable and believable world, though this stage was actually the opposite in terms of cleanliness. Jolly Rogers Lagoon, the town area in particular, no one really talks about 90% of that level. The developers of Grunty's Revenge must have been reading my childhood mind, because they basically combined the town of Jolly Rogers Lagoon with all the disgusting filth of Rusty Bucket Bay. I love this. Spiller's Harbour is a coastal holiday town that has been massively polluted thanks to Grunty. We get to explore multiple suites, including one named after my boy Tip Top, which is all fun and games until we realise we need the golden feathers to progress, this move is probably the one that is recontextualized the most, well apart from egg shooting. Rather than being something we can activate whenever we need to, it requires context sensitive pads kind of like the shock spring jump, oh yeah and that's also introduced here but there's not much to say about it. Because of the mandatory usage of gold feather pads, we can't just cheese every area. I don't really mind this change, it is odd, but then again given the number of buttons available on the Game Boy Advance, it was probably for the best that we had to limit it this way. A large variety of enemies appear here, but they're almost all ones the game has used before. But we do have a returning face from the first game, the boom boxes from Rusty Bucket Bay being a new returning face of sorts. Oh yeah, and there is actually a new face introduced here, but it's just some birds, and we have to brutally murder them in order to progress with the level. An ice cream truck in town is being operated by Alfred Peacock, but because of all the birds, he can't continue his work. Once again, we solve his issue and he rewards us. Strangely, it's with ice cream instead of something useful like a jiggy, but it does make sense, he, he sells ice cream for a living. This isn't much, but Spiller's Harbour is the closest the game gets to following in Tui's more convoluted trappings. It's not as drastic as that, but here we're doing a task to reward us, so we can do another task that will ultimately lead to a jiggy. And as someone that likes Tui's slower pace and the ability to string us along, this is grand. And for everyone who hated it, just calm down, this is very short and simple. The ice cream is something we need to pass on to a child squid. A sentient brown blob thing, which is deliberately vague in what it actually is. The young sludge won't go back to his mum without an ice cream, and there's a sibling too that won't go back without getting his toy back. Getting each squid their respective items in turn leads to the mum giving you a jiggy for compensation. This is kind of reminiscent of the Boggy family, but at least these squidders are still beautiful on the inside whereas Boggy himself is rotten to the core and I'm glad he was cut from this game. Spiller's Harbour isn't afraid of adding new series favourites to the ever-expanding Banjo cast. They get to take a spotlight here, and they're, uh, briefly a Banjo pilot, and okay, that's it. But they at least are unique, and would fit in with the other Banjo games if we ever got them. A lot of other characters in the game are much more bland, like Mr. Ripovsky, or characters like Mother Clucker or a Dolphin, who I suspect are only here because the developers already had sound clips from the earlier games. 
Oh yeah, and Mr. Rybovsky. This level does at least add a nice extra element to him. Here he requires coins before we can attempt this slide, and we have to get these five coins first before we can do the minigame to get to the Jiggy. This is another one of those tasks that require that we have to do something prior before we actually get to the fun. Plus it kind of reminds me of Jolly Roger Lagoon's doubloons, which was a system I really enjoyed. While I do love Spiller's Harbor, I do need to get a few complaints out of the way before I move on to the game's second best transformation. The game has fences that look like they should be able to be overcome with a simple jump, but we can't. They're actually much more of a barrier than they look, and I don't mind them being barriers, I just wish they didn't look the way they did. This wasn't introduced in this stage, but it's most notable here because one of these is one that we do have to go through with the mouse transformation. I just wish they made the walls look higher, maybe put barbed wire or some other better visual indicator on it. And the one other area of this level that requires the mouse is the sand castle, and honestly I do kind of love it, but there is one exception that really ruins the experience. This whole sub area is great to explore, but we're collecting yellow items in a room that is almost all yellow. It all blends together, and I wish there was much more contrast between the two, or like a thicker outline, or just something like that. This is especially bad on the original Game Boy Advance, but frankly, everything is bad on that. But excluding the issue of finding collectibles in here, this whole beach part of the level is great, and it even gave the developers an excuse to hide the cow here, which is actually a tradition with this team. The mouse, his time to shine is over. We now have the cute little octopus transformation, and this is also another favourite of mine. The toxic water here is now at our mercy as we have free reign over it, and because of this the octopus transformation is probably the best in terms of utility. So much of this level, and the next, open up now that harmful water is good. And thanks to this form, we can access some pipes to get the last few collectibles and leave. And unfortunately we can't leave the level while transformed, nor are we forcibly transformed back into base Banjo and Kazooie if we move too far away from Mumbo's range. Instead we just get a message telling us the magic won't work, and we have to walk all the way back to Mumbo's pad, and this is a bit of a blemish on the game's fantastic transformation system. I don't want to have to backtrack for like 20 seconds, I have things to do, okay? This game peaked with Spiller's Harbor, and this is even the stage we got the really fun Mecha Grunty fight when we have to shoot at her. The problem with the game peaking before it's over is that it's all downhill from here, and even when it's still good, it is comparatively lesser. So, Freezing Furnace. This isn't my favourite level by any means, and it does have to unfortunately be placed next to my favourite one. But on its own, this is still a great final level and it ratchets up the challenge, which is code for me saying I dined the most here. On the surface, Freezing Furnace might just seem to be a prototypical snow and ice level, but it's more than that, it's also a lava world. So it's actually just a lesser Hailfire Peaks, but still, the idea is cool even if it was done before. The enemy roster has been shrunk down as well, and it's almost entirely made up of familiar faces or palette swapped variations. But we do get the Biggie Foot here, this is a Yeti-like creature from Hailfire Peaks, Ice Side of Tui. What a sight for sore eyes, they get one more Ice World Lava World combination to frolic in. The Fire Side is much more than just a generic Fire World though, it's actually called Grunty Industries. And unlike the original Grunty Industries, this isn't a large labyrinth by any means. It's actually very simply laid out, but this is also where my deaths peaked. Damn lava. This level is kind of like Bad Magic Bayou in the sense that it has two different levels stitched together, but it also sets off a speculation part of my brain just like that level did. Is this the same Grunty Industries from Tui, but just earlier in time? Is Grunty Industries much bigger than we initially thought with more underground sections, or are there multiple industrial plants with this name? Or maybe this is the old location and they moved it later to the Isle of Hags, but if this is the same physical location despite what the hub world implies, does this mean Freezing Furnace is related to Hellfire Peaks? The Yeti helps to link it, and this is the one level in Tui where we don't actually get to see a proper entrance to it, so it's more up in the air as to where it actually is located on the Isle of Hags. And the connection goes deeper. In Banjo Pilot, Grunty Industries and Hailfire Peaks use the same music track. Just ignore the fact that Freezing Furnace is in the game with a different song, because that kind of goes against the agenda I'm pushing here. 
Freezing Furnace is the best the game gets in terms of making my brain hyperfixate on stuff of no actual importance. But how is it at an actual level? Um, it's fun. It does introduce my least favourite of the game's transformations though, Tank Banjo. I do like it, especially with its limited movement which is put to some great use with some challenges. If this was given to us earlier, I would probably love it and put it above the other transformations. It's just that because it's at the end of the game, it doesn't feel as impressive and we only get to use it in this one level, and again in Bad Magic Bayou where we have to backtrack. I am fine with backtracking collectathon games, but it depends on how it's implemented. Consistency is the key. Banjo-Kazooie does this once in the middle and it ruins the flow of the game during that period. Banjo-Tooie is built around this and I actually prefer it there since every level will basically require you backtrack with new moves and with alternate sections of the levels that are rewarded to you much later. It's a game built around backtracking and we have to go into it knowing that we're only collect a few things each stage, progressing and coming back later to finish the job. If the whole game was built around backtracking it may have been preferable. But Grunty's Revenge falls a bit more on the side of Banjo-Kazooie, but at least in this one instance, it's less of a pace breaker. The one time we're backtracking is at the end of the game, and it's because of a new transformation which feels a lot more justified than learning how to wear a special pair of shoes. Honestly, if the level order was kept exactly as it was, and we didn't backtrack with a tank, it would be pretty disappointing the tank was only used in one level. I feel like a better way to implement the tank would have been to put it in the second level of the game, and that way we get to use every transformation in multiple levels without any backtracking. It does feel strange that it's the second stage of the game that doesn't reward us a new form, whereas you feel it should be at the end of the game. But as it stands, it still does work out even if it's not the ideal solution. Tank transformation aside, Freezing Furnace is extremely lacking if I only mention the new things it adds because we're basically running out of those. But I will give it credit on refining what worked earlier to be the best those concepts got. The top-down minigame here is basically a harder version of what Blubber provided way back in Brie Gull Beach, and this is so much more fun and probably my favourite minigame here. This is also a task involving Mr. Ripovsky, but he's not the one giving the missions, he's the opponent trying to take advantage of his talking beings called Snowies. So even if this is Mr. Grafowski actually being very evil, this is the best content he's involved in, so good for him. Another example of things going above and beyond is the Klungo fight here. These fights are frankly overdone, and this isn't even the last one, as we'll have to see him again at the very end of the game. But here we have ice physics and the fear of falling off the stage to really spike up the challenge and the amount of effort I need to afford. And even the fishing minigame that I don't like is much more challenging here, and it's more fun because of it. I'd rather be annoyed than bored, I guess. It's not a ringing endorsement, but Freezing Furnace as the last level does the best job it can with this kind of stuff. And once this level is beaten, we have one more place to go, Gruntilda's Lair itself. And this is not surprisingly just a final boss confrontation, which mostly boils down to redoing the fights of Grunty and Klungo again, but they're even harder. Well, Grunty's hardy here. Klunko still has more tricks, but it's not on the icy surface, so it's actually less challenging. Between the multiple phases, we're tasked with completing Grunty's quiz show, and frankly, this is the best the series ever got with this idea. Kazooie's ending dragged with Furnace fun, and Tui's was less annoying, but it still went on far too long. This is a trope the series basically needs, and it wouldn't feel like Banjo without this pace-breaking tedium. If they made a Banjo-Kazooie game without a quiz at the end, I would write my manifesto about how they ruined the series. Banjo Pilot, I am looking at you. The quiz sections here are very simple, quick, and they don't overstay their welcome. And most importantly, it's broken up with fight phases, which is just generally better pacing. After answering all these questions and doing all these repeated fights, we get a new phase with Grunty on top of her lair, and this is frankly my favourite final boss in the series, and yes I know how contentious that is to say. This isn't as spectacular as the earlier predecessors, but it puts what we've learnt to great use, and the tiny arena gives us much more close calls as we have to dodge and weave. But even if this section wasn't my favourite, this entire final confrontation is still one that I would say is the best in the series because of how dramatically improved the quiz section is. 
Not surprisingly, Grunty is defeated and goes back to her rock in the present time, and everything is all set up for Banjo Tooie storyline. With the exception of Banjo going back to his own time period and seeing multiple Banjos all at his home, since Mumbo's magic had some kinks to it. That is, if you didn't get 100%. There is another ending where things return to normal and everything is great, and Honeybee and Mumbo get to know each other. You're presented with a card displaying how well you did, and if you want that last jiggy to be lit up, go back and replay the game, but better. And I sure did. When I played this game to record footage, I 100%ed it twice in a single day. And with my second run, I knew to skip all the cutscenes, which dramatically improved the pace of the opening, and I planned my routes better, and I avoided all those needless deaths. It was a blast. Grunty's Revenge isn't trying to be the next epic in the series that'll consume your entire weekend. This is a game you play from beginning to end while lying in bed. This is the gold standard for replayability and short bursts of fun that Rare ever put together. This game might be two hours long to get through, but it has so much more than two hours worth of fun attached to it. This is an evergreen game that I'll come back and revisit much more than its complicated console counterparts, even if those do have higher highs. Grunty's Revenge may not be the best game in the series, but it's the one that will always be there for me, and it's the one that I will always come back to the most. <laughs>